This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Expert in mesenteric occlusive disease, so he will be talking to us about mesenteric ischemia and current concept. Thank you, Dr. Indy. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, I have, I guess, a special interest in mesenteric ischemia. And so what I hope to do is to share some of my thoughts about it and some of the things that we've done at the University of Kentucky. By way of uh, getting started, I want to make sure everybody realizes that the University of Kentucky is located in Lexington, not Louisville. Often when I'm traveling, people ask me if I'm from Louisville or or if that's where the Kentucky Derby is. No, Kentucky Derby is in Louisville, not Lexington. But Kentucky leads the nation in a number of things, smoking, cancer deaths, obesity, coronary disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and of course, basketball. Uh, And that's for probably all those people out there that are from Duke and North Carolina and UF and that sort of thing. Just want to remind you that we're first in basketball. So what I'd like to do today is uh, review the anatomy and physiology as it relates to mesenteric ischemia. Just do that briefly. I'll spend most of my time talking about acute and chronic mesenteric ischemia. Some discussion about the role of endovascular treatment in particularly acute ischemia. And then I'll also describe some of the stuff that we've done at the University of Kentucky where we've modified how we treat mesenteric ischemia, particularly with an open operation. Well, this is a patient that I actually saw last week, a 34-year-old woman that has had progressive weight loss. She says 20 pounds and postprandial abdominal pain. The pain has progressed to the point that she's now constant pain. I think of note is that she's a 43-year-old woman. She's not somebody that's elderly. She is a current smoker, had a prior history of diabetes and post second. She does deny a history of cardiac disease, denies history of MI, engine, or any arrhythmia. And about a month prior to us seeing her, she had a stent place in her celiac artery discharged on oral anticoagulant, but had no change in her abdominals. And this is a representative CT scan that we had of her. You can obviously see the stent here included, and her SMA is also occluded. And so this is a patient that presents with chronic mesenteric ischemia. And the question is, how do we treat that? Before we get to that, let me talk a little bit about the epidemiology of the disease. It's uh, occlusive disease of the mesenteric vessels tends to affect older patients, but as I just pointed out, it can be seen in younger patients, and I think that's something that's critical to know, that it's not just a disease that's seen in the elderly. It tends to affect women more than men. I'm not entirely sure why. There are some categories of mesenteric ischemia where the ratio is flipped. It's a rare diagnosis. It's estimated that uh, admissions for acute mesenteric ischemia range between about seven and 10 per 100,000 admissions, and for chronic mesenteric ischemia, even less, about one in 100,000 admissions. For chronic mesenteric ischemia, as we'll talk about, symptoms usually don't develop until at least two or more of the mesenteric vessels are involved with uh, severe stenosis. And so this results in a delay of diagnosis, not only because it's a rare disease and it's not thought of, but there's a lot of causes for abdominal pain. And so often when they're seen initially, either in the office or the emergency room, mesenteric ischemia is overlooked as a cause of their problems. You all know the anatomy. There's three main mesenteric arteries, the celiac artery, the SMA, and the inferior mesenteric artery. And fortunately, there's a rich collateral between them. Between the celiac and the SMA, there's the gastroduodenal and the superior inferior pancreatical duodenal arcades. In the SMA and the IMA, there's the marginal artery of Drummond and the arc of Riolan. The hypogastric supply uh, blood flow via the middle and inferior rectal arteries to the IMA via the superior rectal artery. But again, in chronic disease, at least two vessels are involved. So I'd like to discuss some issues, particularly with acute mesenteric ischemia at this point. This is a life-threatening condition, and historically, it's carried a very high risk of mortality. Historically, it's been felt that 70 to 90 percent of patients that present with acute mesenteric ischemia die. More recent contemporary reviews would show perhaps a little better mortality, but it's still high at about 60 to 80 percent. And when we reviewed our experience, and I'll go over that a little bit later, 
about a decade ago, we still had about 60% mortality in our hands. I'd like to emphasize, and, it's, and I'll repeat this over and over, for mesenteric ischemia, particularly acute mesenteric ischemia, the treatment goals are twofold. One is to restore blood flow to the intestine. The second is to preserve as much intestine as possible, and they go hand in hand. And you have to think about both when you're treating these patients. It's critical that these patients have an early diagnosis, and that's really felt to be a key to survival and to better outcome for these patients. So because it's relatively uncommon, it may not be considered initially, and that's a problem. Unfortunately, there's no specific diagnostic test that's going to say, yes, this is mesenteric ischemia, or no, it's not. And the key, again, is intervene before the bowel dies. So time is of the essence. The pathophysiology is fairly simple. There's an interruption of perfusion to the intestine. This results in vasodilation and decreased resistance. Because there's inadequate flow, there's inadequate recruitment of collateral blood flow. This results in a paradoxical vasoconstriction, which results in arterial thrombosis, and the circle is continued. There's more ischemia. All of this ultimately then results in bowel infarction. There's a number of categories for acute mesenteric ischemia, and the ones that I'm going to talk about are primarily listed here. The ones that we typically think about are embolic occlusion and thrombosis of underlying atherosclerotic disease. But you also have to think about mesenteric venous thrombosis, so obstruction or occlusion of the vessels on the other side of the bowel. There's also non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. More recently, there's a number of reports and papers regarding isolated mesenteric dissection. It usually occurs in the SMA, but can occur in the celiac artery. And then I'm going to briefly mention colon ischemia is related to aortic surgery as well. So again, the treatment goals are to establish blood flow and then to evaluate bowel viability, re resect the infarctive bowel, but preserve as much bowel as possible. The first category of acute mesenteric ischemia is related to arterial embolus, and this accounts for about half of those patients that present with acute mesenteric ischemia. These patients typically present with sudden onset of severe abdominal pain. When you evaluate them in the emergency room, they're fine at one point, and suddenly they have the onset of severe abdominal pain. This can also be associated with some sort of gut emptying. Either they vomit as they have the abdominal pain or they have a large bowel movement. They might even say diarrheal movement with the onset of the pain. The embolus is most often to the superior mesenteric artery and it's most often a cardiac source. So these patients often have a history of atrial fibrillation, a myocardial infarction or ventricular aneurysm. And at least in my practice, if I have a patient that's somewhat elderly, as a history of AFib and abdominal pain, that's pretty much acute mesenteric ischemia until proven otherwise. The embolus lodges in an area of the vessel where it becomes narrow, and so this is often distal to the origin of the SMA, and so the proximal jejunal branches are spared. And that's important to know because if you're looking at a CT scan, particularly axial cuts, you need to make sure that you don't just look at the origin. Sometimes you can get fooled and look at the origin and say, oh, the SMA is open, but as you go down, it's occluded from the embolus. So keep looking as you go down that SMA. So when you do operate on these patients, you see that there's sparing of the proximal jejunum, but ischemia of the distal jejunum, ileum, and the ascending colon. Again, the hallmark of this condition is it's pain out of proportion to the physical exam. Talk to the students about how they see a patient in the ER and walk to the bedside or to the side of the gurney and they expect to find peritonitis and yet the abdomen is soft. That's pain out of proportion to the physical exam. There is no reliable laboratory study, although in my experience, usually the white blood cell count is markedly elevated and often the lactate is also elevated as well. This is an emergency condition. They need to be treated as such. The treatment is an embolectomy. The way I expose the superior mesenteric artery is expose it at the base of the mesentery. I retract the transverse colon and its mesentery cephalad and retract the small bowel and its mesentery caudad. I make an incision, a longitudinal incision in the root of the mesentery. 
as you dissect down, usually you're going to find the superior mesenteric vein initially, and the, the artery is located to the patient's left and just deep to the vein. You need to control the jejunal branches, make a transverse arteriotomy, and then pass a Fogarty catheter up into the aorta. Usually a number uh, four Fogarty is, is what I would use. I think the thing to be careful about is doing the distal embolectomy. The mesenteric vessels are small and fragile, and so you have to be very careful if you're passing a Fogarty distally into the mesentery so that you don't overinflate and rupture a mesenteric vessel and thus creating a big hematoma and putting that segment of bowel at risk just because of the hematoma that you created. So some people have described actually milking the distal vessels between putting their hands on either side of the mesentery and milking it out. I'll often, through my arteriotomy, pull the clot out of the distal vessel, and that usually is satisfactory. Once flow has been reestablished, you need to then evaluate the bowel, resect any bowel that is clearly infarcted, and then consider a second look uh, laparotomy, again, to preserve as much a small bowel as possible. The next category is arterial thrombosis. This accounts for about a quarter to up to a third of patients that present with acute mesenteric ischemia. In my experience, these are typically older patients. Their abdominal pain is usually more gradual in its onset, so hours as opposed to, if you will, minutes or seconds. Most surprisingly do not have a history of prior weight loss or postprandial pain. In fact, it's been stated that only about 20% will give a history consistent with chronic mesenteric ischemia. They often have other manifestations of atherosclerotic disease. So these are patients that when you examine their distal pulses, they may have an abnormal pulse or an abnormal ankle brachial index. They may have had another intervention such as a carotid end arterectomy or a lower extremity bypass or an angioplasty. They also have a history of coronary artery disease, but as opposed to an arrhythmia that you typically find with a patient that has an embolus, these are patients that have had a myocardial infarction, a cabbage, or some sort of coronary stent. And at least in our practice, they all, essentially every one of them has a very strong history of smoking. Again, there's no reliable laboratory marker to rule out or rule in this condition. This occlusion is typically at the origin of the vessel, and so therefore uh, the proximal jejunum is ischemic. These are a little bit harder patients to revascularize. Typically, they're going to require a bypass, so options are either a retrograde orientation or an antegrade orientation. Need to decide whether you're going to use a prosthetic a graft or an autogenous uh, tissue. You could try a thrombectomy with a retrograde angioplasty, and this recently is, there's been a, a number of papers that have suggested that this would perhaps be the initial approach. I've tried it. I've had some success, but I'll tell you, for me, often the wire goes sub-intimal, tracks into the aorta, and I can never get it to come back into the aorta. And I think it's probably because, and we'll talk about this uh, later, that the plaque is actually aortic plaque as opposed to plaque that develops in the vessel itself. Some physicians would suggest doing thrombolysis and then follow with an angioplasty and stent. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Again, once the flow has been reestablished, the bowel needs to be addressed, resecting the infarcted bowel and again, consider a second look laparotomy for bowel that is, it's not clear whether it's viable or not. So that sort of brings up the question, how do we determine whether the bowel is viable? I think the first thing is just look at it and feel it. Often after revascularization, the bowel will pink up. It almost looks hyperemic in its color. And then there's areas that are clearly infarcted and then areas that you just can't tell. Clearly, palpation of pulses in the mesentery is another way to determine whether or not you have good flow. And a bowel that's uh, viable will peristalse, a bowel that is dead will not. We often use a Doppler. And if you can place a Doppler on the anti-mesenteric border of the bowel and hear a Doppler signal, that's pretty good evidence that you could have good blood flow to the bowel. You can also put the Doppler over the distal mesenteric vessels to see if you can hear uh, signals. Fluorescein, I've used, take an amp of fluorescein, have the anesthesiologist injected IV, and then use a Woods lamp to see what's perfused and what's not. 
The one issue with that is it's a one-shot deal. You can't repeat it. In other words, you can't look at the file and say, well, maybe I want to try again to see if that segment's viable. It's one shot or none. So despite the attempts to determine whether the bowel is viable, there are going to be times and there are going to be segments where you just can't tell. And sometimes that bowel will come back or be viable. And so that's where a second look uh, laparotomy is important. With a second look laparotomy, the primary goal here is to preserve as much bowel length as possible. So after reperfusion, there will be clearly viable bowel. There will be bowel that's clearly infarcted, and then you have this bowel that you just can't tell. So obviously, the infarcted bowel should be resected at the first operation, but the ischemic indeterminate bowel is left in place and then return in 18 to 36 hours to take a second look. And this ischemic bowel should declare itself. In our experience, sometimes we require more than one second look. We'll take them back for, if you will, a third look or even occasionally for a fourth look. Again, trying to preserve as much bowel as possible. The one thing that I will say is that if you make a decision to do a second look laparotomy, it must be done, even if the patient's doing well. So if you're making rounds on the next day and the patient's sitting up in their bed and they're reading a the newspaper and have a big grin on their face and all of their lab values are normal, but you decided you needed to do a second look because you were concerned about some bowel that was not clearly infarcted, you better take them back. And the issue is that they can be doing well but have a very small portion of bowel that's infarcted and you won't know about it for five or six days until that perforates, and they're going to be real sick at that point. So my rule is, if you decide to do a second look, go back. It has to be done. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and go to the other end of the bowel. Another cause for mesenteric ischemia is venous thrombosis. As opposed to the arterial causes of mesenteric ischemia, this occurs typically in a younger patient group, and the pain is more insidious in its onset. So these are patients that often will come to the emergency room with abdominal pain. It's sort of vague. They're worked up. Their lab values are pretty normal. They can't find anything wrong, and they're sent out with a diagnosis of gastroenteritis. You know, five or six or seven days later, they show up again, and their pain is worse and may even be sent out a, a second time. And eventually they get a CAT scan and then they see something like what you see here. This is the superior mesenteric artery, this is the vein, and this is called a halo sign. So this thrombus in the vein, and there tends to be enhancement on the periphery of the vein, which is diagnostic for venous thrombosis. Many of these patients will have either a personal history of DBT or PE, or family history of some sort of hypercoagulable disorder. And so as part of the workup for these patients, they ought to have a hypercoagulable panel sent off. Other patients that are at risk would be patients that have cirrhosis or post-splenectomy patients. They may or may not have an elevated white count, and just like the other causes, there's nothing specific that's going to point you to a diagnosis of venous thrombosis. As opposed to the other two that we talked about, the treatment here is not surgical, it's anticoagulation with IV heparin initially. And it's felt like once you have a patient with this, that anticoagulation probably ought to be carried out lifelong because they most likely have an underlying hypercoagulable problem. It's important for these patients to resuscitate them with fluid. Uh, the bowel becomes very edematous. It's just like having a DVT in the leg. The leg becomes edematous because of the poor outflow. Same thing with the bowel. It, it sequesters fluid. It's also important to put them at bowel rest. Most would probably recommend parental antibiotics because of the possibility of bacterial translocation. And laparotomy is reserved for those patients that develop peritoneal signs. So I would also, because they're sequestering a lot of fluid, monitor them for abdominal compartment syndrome. That would be another indication for a laparotomy. If you do do a laparotomy, they may have such severe bowel edema that you have difficulty or are unable to close the abdomen. Often, if you look at it, the bowel looks pretty abnormal because it's congested and it has a bluish appearance. 
I would also suggest or state that you really shouldn't make any attempt to do a portal vein or a superior mesenteric vein thrombectomy. Inevitably, this will fail. They will rethrombose, and so it's just not worth the effort to even try it. There has, however, been a number of attempts to do thrombolysis for mesenteric venous thrombosis. As you know, there's no direct access to the superior mesenteric vein or the portal vein, either from the femoral or from the jugular vein. And so a number of techniques have been used to try to get that thrombolytic agent into the portal vein. Some have used a transjugular or transhepatic placement of an infusion catheter. Others have used an ECOS catheter. Um, some have infused it uh, systemically. And then some have also placed or parked a catheter in the superior mesenteric artery and placed the thrombolytic into the superior mesenteric artery, assuming it'll go through the bowel vessels and out into the portal circulation. There's fairly limited series or case reports. I'm not sure that there's any added benefit to thrombolysis, and it seems to me that there's fairly good outcome with anticoagulation, so at least my feeling is I'm not sure there's a benefit with the added risk of either trying to go transhepatic or parking a catheter in the SMA, but it is an option that, that people have tried. If you compare these various vascular type mesenteric ischemia, Typically, patients with an arterial problem are older, while those with the venous thrombosis are younger. Typically, women are at more risk or have a higher incidence with an embolus and thrombosis, and it's about even for venous thrombosis. As it's seen here, there's uh, arrhythmia associated with the embolus, but not with the other types, and these patients would also have a prior embolus. Patients that have venous thrombosis, as I said, they have a prior history of DVT or PE, history of hypercoagulable disorder, and they also could have uh, pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer associated with that, as well as cirrhosis uh, or postplanectomy. Regarding the physical findings, pain is pretty much across the board, but typically the patients with the embolus have more severe pain and it's more sudden onset. Really, only the patients with an embolus will have the risk of having a synchronous embolization, but the other symptoms are, are relatively the same across the board. There is a condition called non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. As it states, the vessels are not occluded, but there is lack of blood flow to the bowel. This accounts for about a fifth of those patients that have acute mesenteric ischemia, and this is related to splenic vasoconstriction. It's usually due to another problem, a decrease in cardiac output, hypovolemia, dehydration, often with vasopressor agents. And that combined is at least the kind of patient I see is a cardiac patient, typically a patient sitting in the ICU on a ventilator after they've had a valve replaced with poor cardiac function. So they're on vasopressor support. The CT surgeons have dried them out with Lasix. Their heart doesn't work well and they're intubated so they can't really tell you that they're having abdominal pain. And we get called when there's an issue that their abdomen is tense, they're distended, and they're not tolerating their tube feeds anymore. These patients often will have an elevated white blood cell count because this has been brewing for a while before it becomes apparent. This is a diffuse process. So if you operate on them, their bowel has patchy, diffuse ischemia. The goal here is to improve the cardiac function, to try to wean them off their vasopressors and to restore the intravascular volume. You can consider an intraarterial infusion of a vasodilator, such as papaverin. Digitalis is associated or has been associated with this, so it would be important to stop any dig that they're being given. One of my former partners always would state that these patients should at least should consider glucagon because at least in rats, it causes uh, mesenteric vasodilatation, but I'm not sure that's been proven in humans. Patients are treated with parental antibiotics, and then they need a repeat arteriogram in about 12 to 24 hours to see if there's any signs of improvement. Laparotomy is uh, reserved for patients that have peritoneal signs, and so they need to be followed closely. More recently, a diagnosis that's been reported is isolated mesenteric dissection. It's fairly rare. In an autopsy series, it was only found in about 0.6% of patients. 
as opposed to some of the other conditions we talked about, this often affects men more than women. Those patients that present with the symptoms, abdominal pain is pretty much universal. They often do not have hypertension, although about half do. Some have hyperlipidemia, smoking, and abdominal tenderness. Some have suggested that there's a possible association with Marfan syndrome or other collagen vascular type of disorders. And it's a rare cause of bowel ischemia. The dissection is usually found in the superior mesenteric artery, and about two-thirds of them is found in that convex curvature of the SMA in this area here. The mean distance from the osteum is usually about three centimeters, and it's felt that this area may be more susceptible to shear forces due to its relationship to the underlying pancreas and may create some complex flow dynamics resulting in that area being at risk for dissection. There's a number of classifications that have been described. Uh, they take account uh, the presence or absence of the false lumen, whether the false lumen is patent or not, whether the true lumen is compressed, any aneurysmal change. And this is one classification as suggested by Yoon, where type one, there's a fenestration proximally and distally. So both the false lumen and the true lumen are patent. Then there's two types, type two, uh, a proximal fenestration, but the uh, false lumen is patent, type 2B, where the false lumen is thrombosed, and type 3, where both the true and the false lumen are thrombosed. Historically, or when these uh, were first described, they were treated fairly aggressive, but over time, it's felt like conservative management is appropriate. That consists of bowel rest, intravenous fluids, and anticoagulation. The anticoagulation is to prevent thrombus propagation. Yuna suggested that perhaps anticoagulation is not even necessary as well. There are indications for more invasive management, and that would again be signs of bowel infarction. Because you can develop aneurysm, these patients can be at risk for arterial rupture. Some patients will have persistent abdominal pain, and so they should be intervened on. And there's some people that would suggest if that true lumen is truly compressed or severely compressed, that perhaps these patients should also be operated on. So the open surgical approach would be an interposition graft, or a bypass uh, or excision of the dissection flap with a patch angioplasty. Many would try to treat this endovascularly, either with a bare metal or a covered stent, or even a retrograde angioplasty. This is an example of a patient that I treated a few years ago. You can see this extensive dissection in the superior mesenteric artery. And this patient actually had gone to the operating room for bowel resection because of infarcted bowel. And we did an intimectomy of the SMA with a retrograde stent. And you can see the post-procedure imaging with the stent in place and the dilatation where we had resected the intima and put a patch on it. And this patient has since done very well. There's been a series that have looked at how to treat these patients. This is a series of 219 patients. Initially, they were treated conservatively in almost 80%. They did have 15 failures. One of them resulted in a death. The other failures were classified as an aneurysm or recurrent or persistent abdominal pain. In this group of 219 patients, open surgical treatment was done in 14, and an initial treatment with endovascular in 25, and only about 4% ever required a bowel resection. And so this is one algorithm for managing these patients for symptomatic dissections. If peritonitis is present, they ought to be explored and have revascularization, whether it's by stenting or an open procedure. If peritonitis is absent, then I would recommend conservative management with anticoagulation for a week. If their symptoms are relieved and they're tolerating regular diet, continued conservative management. If they continue to have symptoms but no peritonitis, give them another week. If there's progression of their symptoms or peritonitis, they need to be operated on. And similarly, after assessing them for another week, they're either continued conservative management or surgical management. Just a couple of words about colon ischemia after aortic procedure, and I bring this up, I guess, primarily because some of the work done in this area was done by my predecessors at the University of Kentucky. 
As you probably know, there's a higher incidence of colon ischemia after ruptured aneurysms. It's likely multifactorial due to the hypotension associated with the rupture, uh, hematoma that's compressing the mesenteric vessels, perhaps inadequate hypogastric flow, either because the vessels have been excluded or oversown. And uh, Hegeher and Ernst at our institution studied this, and they found that if the IMA stump pressure was greater than 40, patients likely had adequate perfusion, or if they measured a stump to systemic ratio of greater than 0.4, likewise, that would indicate adequate perfusion to the colon. The incidence that they found of ischemic colitis was about 7%, but it was higher in patients that had ruptures, aneurysms. I think the key here is to try and prevent it. So in doing an endovascular repair of an aneurysm, maintaining flow in the hypogastric arteries would be important. And if it's an uh, open aneurysm, evaluating the status of the inferior mesenteric artery. And if there's poor flow, I look at it after I've revascularized. If it's pumping back at me, I feel comfortable ligating it. If it's occluded to begin with, I don't think there's any need to re-implant it or to try to get blood flow into it. But if the blood flow is just sort of dribbling out, that's probably the patient that needs to have it re-implanted. After uh, surgery, if it develops, patients need broad-spectrum antibiotics. So they need to be resuscitated, and they need a colectomy for full-thickness ischemia. It's important in these patients that if they have an early bowel movement or a bloody bowel movement, that they have a scope in order to look for this complication. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we did look at our experience with mesenteric ischemia at the University of Kentucky about a decade ago. We had in our series, it's relatively small, 58 patients with thrombotic intestinal ischemia. The average age of our patients was about 61, but about a third were younger than 50. But if you look at, it's mostly because the patients that have venous thrombosis are of the younger age. We did exclude non-thrombotic causes such as strangulated hernia, non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia, and colon ischemia after aortic surgery. And you can see the number of patients and how they broke out in our series here. This is a busy slide, but virtually all the patients with arterial embolism had some sort of cardiac disease, and most of that was some sort of arrhythmia, as those patients with venous thrombosis had very little cardiac disease. Smoking was very prevalent in the patients with arterial thrombosis. And the mortality is, as you can see, almost 60% with embolus, over 60% with thrombosis, and only 13% with venous thrombosis. The most common presenting symptom for those patients that had an embolus was abdominal pain. About half of them had nausea or vomiting, about equal distribution between male and female. All but two had a significant cardiac history, and the source of the embolus was cardiac in all but one, and in that patient was a balloon pump. One patient refused surgery. There were five that had a, a celiotomy open only. These are patients where we took a look. We called it a peak and shriek. They had ischemic bowel or infarcted bowel that was not amenable to salvage, and so comfort care was instituted. Eight out of the 22 had some sort of revascularization. There's some that had only a bowel resection. The average length of stay was almost two weeks, even longer if you exclude those patients here that died early because nothing was really done for them. For those that had arterial thrombosis, the onset they had abdominal pain, but not quite as significant as those with the embolus. Only about 10% had a history of weight loss, and, and about 20% had postprandial pain. There were more women in this group than men. All the patients underwent a surgical exploration. Again, there was a fairly significant number that by the time we got there, it was felt to be too late to intervene on them. Again, a lot, relatively long average length of stay, even more so over three weeks if you exclude these patients here that had comfort care only. For those with venous thrombosis, we found a third to have either protein C or protein S deficiency. In this case, more men than women. Only a few patients had operative treatment. Most of them underwent non-operative treatment. We did not try to do any portal venous thrombectomy. We had two deaths in this group. One was a patient that had a pancreatic duodenectomy who developed an asthmatic leak and likely died from complications from the leak. And the second patient was a patient who had a very delayed diagnosis, 
45 days after the onset of symptoms. And by the time it was figured out, he had generalized peritonitis uh, from bowel perforation. And again, a fairly long length of stay. Our conclusion from our review is that the mesenteric ischemia tends to occur in older patients, but they can be in younger patients. Early diagnosis and intervention is the key. So if you were to exclude patients that had extensive bowel necrosis and underwent comfort care, our mortality was better, but it's still pretty dismal. We would advocate non-operative treatment for mesenteric venous thrombosis, and of course, patients should be evaluated for a hypercoagulable state in those with venous thrombosis. The question comes up, is there a role for endovascular treatment? And I was, the con, cons is that uh, what's critical to outcome is the status of the bowel. And these are, because these patients have many comorbid conditions, they have little uh, physiologic reserve. And so you can't really fool around with these patients and expect to have good survival. And uh, the concern is that an endovascular approach could delay revascularization of the bowel, and perhaps this ultimately places the patient at increased risk. Again, if you avoid the laparotomy, uh, you have to remember the goals of treatment is, again, to establish blood flow to the bowel, but also to evaluate the viability of the bowel. And it's kind of hard to look at the bowel without taking a look in there. Can we accomplish these goals without doing an open operation? Well, obviously, you can revascularize with thrombolysis or mechanical-based uh, thrombectomy. There are people that would suggest that advanced imaging techniques would help uh, determine whether or not the bowel is viable, and they would advocate that patients need to be very carefully monitored, and laparoscopy is needed. Can we reestablish perfusion quickly? Well, in the reports that are done, those patients that had catheter-based procedures took 62 hours before they had initiation of uh, revascularization or the thrombolysis, whereas for patients that had an open operation, it was within about a day. And this suggests to me that there may be some selection bias in some of these studies that the sicker patients underwent an open operation. Also, over two-thirds of the patients underwent an open operation if they had an embolus can take a while for thrombolysis or the uh, minimally invasive uh, revascularization to be effective. And it takes a while for the procedure as well. There will be some technical failures, although close to 90% were successful. But the concern there is if it is a technical failure, that further delays open revascularization. Can you identify or can you figure out if the bowel is viable? In series, it's somewhere between a third and almost all patients require some sort of bowel resection. Arthur's study, they reserved laparotomy for those that had clinical signs of deterioration, and they stated that 30% of their patients avoided a laparotomy, but still 70% of patients underwent a laparotomy. And a quote from their paper is, necrotic bowel requiring resection negatively affected mortality. So delaying looking at the bowel can have a negative effect on the outcome of these patients. Can we really differentiate between infarcted and ischemic bowel? I'm not convinced that we can at this point. And the other concern I have is that it requires an experienced clinician at the bedside to reassess. And at least in my experience, we're relying more and more on scanning, and often they're not at the bedside to reassess or determine if there's patients getting into trouble. Is there a proven advantage with endovascular treatment? Well, there's few studies that compare the two head-to-head. I think there's an inherent bias uh, that more acutely ill patients who likely have poor collateral flow will be the ones that will get a more urgent open operation, whereas those that do well with thrombolysis, they probably have collateral vessels to begin with that and may be better able to tolerate the ischemia. And again, as I stated before, missed bowel infarction, even if it's focal, can be catastrophic. So my conclusion is that I advocate an aggressive approach to restoration of flow and an open approach so that you can evaluate both the the status of the bowel and at the same time reestablish perfusion to the bowel. Let me say a few words about chronic mesenteric ischemia. Uh, Again, let me start with a patient here. This is a 45-year-old woman. Again, note, a very young woman with postprandial pain and significant weight loss. 
Six years before she presented, she had had an anti-grade aortoceliac SMA bypass and the graft failed, both limbs failed. She then went to the University of Michigan where a transaortic endarterectomy was done and she now presents with occlusion of her mesenteric vessels. So obviously she has a hostile abdomen. There's been a transperitoneal as well as a retroperitoneal incision. And so we got a diagnostic angiogram. This is a flush aortogram and I think what you can see is that the renal vessels are patent, but you really don't see any of the mesenteric vessels, even though that catheter should be high enough to visualize them. This is the lateral projection. There's the stump of the celiac artery, the SMA, and you see no IMA. And if you do late delayed films, you can see that this collateral filling this arcade here, which fills the SMA and you get a hint of the celiac branches up in this area. And so the question is, how would you approach this patient? Well, chronic mesenteric ischemia, probably 90% of it is due to atherosclerotic disease. And this is a disease that's at the origin of the vessels. It's really, in, in reality, aortic plaque. There are other causes for chronic mesenteric ischemia, and they're listed here, but we're gonna focus on atherosclerotic disease here. Typically, these are patients in their 50s or 60s. Again, there's a higher female to male ratio. Sorry about the interruption. I'm gonna skip a lot over some of the chronic mesenteric ischemia. I wanna to get to this part here, and then I'll, I'll try to end and answer some questions. One of the things that we've been doing at the University of Kentucky is we've developed a different way of revascularizing patients with chronic or even acute mesenteric ischemia. And this was just recently published in Annals of Vascular Surgery. Our fellow Dan Badia did these drawings and what the idea here is that we take our graft and instead of the typical way is with a retrograde bypass is to make a kind of a lazy C loop, what we do is a direct tunneling right through the mesentery and if we need to go on and revascularize the celiac artery, we'll go through the mesentery of the uh, large colon and bring it up to the hepatic artery like this. This is an interoperative photograph, and I know they're not great, but this is the right common iliac artery here, the anastomosis of our vein graft being here, and we typically used uh, deep vein. In this patient, we did a side-to-side -side anastomosis, so it's hard to see the superior mesenteric artery, which is lying underneath, but this is the superior mesenteric vein, this being the transverse colon. And in this particular patient, we did take it on up to the celiac artery. So we're tunneling it directly through the mesentery of the colon. And then this is the anastomosis over here to the uh, hepatic artery. You can see the common hepatic artery here. This is our vein graft and we do an end uh, to side anastomosis. And if you look at it on uh, 3D reconstruction, this is typically what we have is the bypass that comes up this way. Uh, side to side anastomosis and then to side uh, anastomosis to the hepatic artery up here. We did look at our open revascularization. We had 16 patients that we did anagrade, 25 that we did retrograde. More of them were done for acute ischemia that had the retrograde bypass, but otherwise they were pretty well matched when they when it came to their comorbidities. It took less time for us to do the retrograde bypass. We did a bypass only to the SMA in most patients. Two of them had it to both, excuse me. And whereas with the anagrade, all but one had the bypass to both the SMA and the celiac artery. It also looks like over time, we've begun to prefer doing the retrograde bypass as opposed to the antegrade bypass. So this is a patient that I presented right at the beginning of the talk. This patient, we did do an ileo SMA and hepatic artery bypass to revascularize both of her vessels. And in this patient that I just more recently presented, we did an ileo SMA bypass again using vein. This is again a schematic of what we do. I think some of the things that we feel strongly about is that we use vein. Typically, I like to use deep vein because it's consistently good quality. If I do use the deep vein, I invert the veins and lyse the valves under direct vision. You can go to either the right or the left iliac artery and access it easily. We try to put the tunnel within the bowel mesentery. And then as I said, it's a side-to-side -side anastomosis if you're going on to do both. 
Obviously, you can do endovascular treatment for patients, and I'm just not, I'm not going to go through this. It can be done retrograde, and it can be effective. Median arcuate ligament syndrome, just a couple of comments. I don't think I believe in this uh, diagnosis. I think that the pain is most often due to compression of the celiac plexus, but clearly if it's being treated, you have to divide the median arcuate ligament angioplasty of just the celiac artery will not be sufficient. And then one last very quick comment. There's other things that affect the mesentery. This is a patient that I did where the patient had bacterial endocarditis with an infected SMA and we reconstructed it with greater saphenous vein with a bunch of little bypass grafts as well. So in conclusion, uh, mesenteric disease is a relatively unusual diagnosis. Again, I want to emphasize acute mesenteric ischemia must be recognized early and there are different causes for it. I would still say that open revascularization would be the standard of care for acute mesenteric ischemia. Chronic mesenteric ischemia can be addressed with an endovascular approach. There is some evidence that I didn't go over that suggests using a covered stent has better outcome than a, than a bare metal stent. It, regarding an operative approach, it's, it's again, satisfactory to do an anti-grade bypass, but we have gotten to the point where we prefer a retrograde bypass. Mesenteric dissections are being observed with more frequency. Most of those can be treated with anticoagulation and observation. And then there's obviously some cases of mesenteric ischemia that uh, are unusual, such as trauma or infection. So again, I apologize for the interruption, but I want to thank you. And I will see if I can pull up some questions. Right, before we got interrupted, I think a couple of trainees were asking how you felt about the use of diagnostic laparoscopy in the setting of acute mesenteric ischemia rather than laparotomy? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And um, I think that if one were to treat the acute mesenteric ischemia with a minimally invasive approach, that's a reasonable thing. My concern is you really have to be a good laparoscopist and be able to confidently see the entire bowel. Because again, you can have a small area that's not viable and if you miss it, it's going to be a catastrophe for the patient. If you have that confidence or you have that ability, I think that's a, a reasonable thing to do. Again, I think in my hands, um, doing it all at once, getting the bowel revascularized and taking a really good look at the, at the bowel at the time is the way I tend to go. All right. Another question. Some of the traditional teaching will tell us that if we are going to use a retrograde bypass using graded saphenous vein, we'll tend to kink and all these things. Can you tell us about some of the technical aspects to avoid this? Yeah. Well, that's why we do the direct approach. I have that concern that I don't know how to make that saphenous vein loop appropriately so that it doesn't kink at some point. So that's why we tunnel that graft directly to the SMA, right up through the, the mesentery. And that takes all the guesswork out of it. And again, we have used uh, greater saphenous vein to do this. I prefer vein over prosthetic because I think that there is a chance that the bowel will come in touch with the prosthetic and I just don't like that. I prefer to use the deep vein because I think this is a really important bypass and I want to have the best conduit possible. And sometimes the saphenous vein is great in the proximal thigh, but it peters out as you go down, whereas the deep vein is always consistently good. So we've sort of gone to that, but again, it's that direct tunneling approach that prevents that kinking. All right, and there was one last question by one of our attendees as well was for those patients that have chronic mesenteric ischemia and both celiac and SME may occluded, are you a proponent of always revascularizing both or you think just doing the SMA does the job? I think that in the majority of patients doing just the SMA is fine. I, I don't have any good criteria to, to pass on when you should do both. But again, using vein and with this uh, retrograde approach we've had, very good outcomes, very, very good longevity with our bypasses. I think I've had to angioplasty 
two patients, both of which it was not the bypass, but the one it was uh, some narrowing that developed in an aorta by femme limb that we based the bypass on, and in another patient it was progression of atherosclerotic disease in the iliac artery, but the vein graft itself remained widely patent. And so we've had uh, really good success with that. Most patients are going to do fine if you just bypass to the SMA. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Dr. Thank Andy. you. I'm sorry for that interruption. We'll figure out what happened. No problem. Thank you All very right. much. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank you.